Welcome tonight. Um, tonight is Imaging Techniques and Emerging Therapies for Geographic Atrophy. So, and we're joined by Dr. Carolyn Major. I'm your host, Dr. Jennifer Stewart. It's my great pleasure tonight to introduce Dr. Caroline Major. She's a doctor of optometry and a fellow of the American Academy of Optometry and Optometric Retina Society. She received her doctorate of optometry from the Pennsylvania College of Optometry at Salis University and completed an ocular disease residency at the Eye Institute of the Pennsylvania College of Optometry. Following completion of her residency, she served as chief of the retinal disease clinic an assistant professor at the University of the Incarnate Word Rosenberg School of Optometry for eight years. In 2019, she joined the Northeastern State University Oklahoma College of Optometry as an associate professor and the director of residency programs. Her research interests include retina disease and OCT angiography. It is my pleasure to welcome you tonight. You guys are in for a wonderful, wonderful lecture, and I'll turn it over to you. Oh, thank you so much, Dr. Stewart. And it's a pleasure to be here. I want to thank Wu University for having me back. I had such a fun time the first time I lectured here. I'm really excited for this evening and talking about a really hot topic now in optometry and eye care in general, geographic atrophy, for which we now have two FDA approved medications. And jump forward here. So tonight's lecture, imaging te techniques and emerging therapies for geographic atrophy. And here are my disclosures. So I am a paid consultant and speaker for both Iveric Bio as well as Apellus Pharmaceuticals and Carl Zeiss Meditech, which is relevant to this lecture. I also posted a QR code here for you guys to grab the handout and uh, Wu University also posted a handout for you guys as well. So leave that up here for just a second so you guys can grab the handout. So to give you an idea of what we're going to cover over this hour, we're going to give a general introduction to macular degeneration in terms of how is the prevalence increasing over time. Then we're going to talk about the staging, specifically how do we stage intermediate non-exudative AMD, where we really need to start doing imaging to looking for early geographic atrophy. Then we're going to talk about imaging technologies, just a general introduction, and how we can utilize multimodal imaging to detect early geographic atrophy, and then use that to also monitor for progression over time. We're going to uh, briefly touch upon the new complement inhibitor therapies for geographic atrophy, of which there are now two that were FDA approved last year talk about when you might want to refer geographic atrophy and then how you're going to educate your patients to set up realistic expectations so that they're successful upon referral and therapy. So by way of introduction, we know that macular degeneration is the leading cause of blindness in the developed world in persons over the age of 50, and it's the third leading cause of blindness worldwide. It's characterized by pathologic alterations in the outer retina, the RPE, Brooks membrane, and the choriocapillaris complex, so outer retinal disease. And this is going to manifest clinically as drusen RPE abnormalities, either hyper or hypopigmentary changes, geographic atrophy, which we're going to talk a lot about tonight, and choroidal neovascularization. In the near future, and even now, really, there's a great demand for AMD eye care due to the growing pop proportion of older adults in the United States. And I'm sure we're all kind of feeling that as well. And in fact, the prevalence of AMD is expected to increase to 22 million by the year 2050. And the number of cases of advanced macular degeneration, that is central GA or neovascular disease, is expected to increase from 1.7 million in 2010 to 3.8 million in 2050. So we are going to be onslaught with uh, eye care related to macular degeneration. We know that only uh, about one-fifth of all AMD cases are exudative or neovascular, but neovascularization accounts for 90% of severe central vision loss from macular degeneration. So although this talk is you know, oriented towards geographic atrophy, I want to start off by telling you still the most common cause of blindness in macular degeneration is neovascular exudative disease. You can't miss it, right? And multimodal imaging is going to be great to detect neovascularization and also geographic atrophy. 
So we're going to be doing a lot of the same imaging techniques. We're just going to be looking at it differently. We're looking for neo, fluid, hemorrhage, but we're also looking for geographic atrophy, which is a referable and treatable condition now. So we think about risk factors for macular degeneration. There are some that are non-modifiable and those that are modifiable. And unfortunately, the two most important risk factors for macular degeneration are non-modifiable, which is age. We know that older age increases the risk for geographic atrophy development. And then genotype or genetic makeup. In ARMS2, genetic mutations have really specifically been linked to an increased risk of both geographic atrophy development and expansion over time. Smoking is the most important modifiable risk factor for macular degeneration and increases the risk of having AMD threefold. And furthermore, we know individuals with macular degeneration who smoke, it really predisposes them to earlier onset advanced stage disease, including geographic atrophy. Now let's review macular degeneration staging and classification. And I want to, you know, put a disclaimer on this. What I have here is a mashup. You know, you got to love mashups where it's a combination of the AREDS categorization scheme as well as the Beckman Committee classification system. And before we go through the individual stages, uh, please note that only foveal or only lesions within two disc uh, diameters of the center of the fovea would be considered. And patients need to be over the age of 50 to have this classification scheme apply. So our first stage would be no macular degeneration, which is category one, which is no drusen or just a few small drusen that are less than 63 microns in size. And then we have early non-exudative macular degeneration, which is characterized by less than 20 medium-sized drusen. And then we have intermediate stage AMD. And this is where it's so key that you're recognizing intermediate stage AMD because there's an 18% risk of converting to advanced stage macular degeneration within the next five years. So we define intermediate stage or AREDS category three AMD as any one of the following features. So at least one large size drusen, and that has to be 125 microns in diameter, which is the same as the width of a vein as it crosses the disc margin. The second would be extensive medium-sized drusen, and 20 soft or 65 hard will get you to meet that particular category. Or pigmentary changes, and this may be hyperpigmentation or hypopigmentation changes. And then non-central geographic atrophy is also included in AREDS category three. And what's so important about intermediate stage AMD this is where you're gonna start incorporating multimodal imaging to detect early geographic atrophy, as well as to detect neovascular exudative disease and refer appropriately. So perform OCT, OCT and geography, fundus autofluorescence. This is where you're gonna start doing those things. You're also gonna start considering prescribing AREDS2 and really emphasizing dietary and behavioral modifications at this stage and monitoring more frequently with imaging technology, right? So this is now we're gonna start rather than a yearly exam, right? We're seeing patients probably every three to six months time frame, depending on how many risk factors are present in that particular case. I think it's also important at this stage to discuss with the patient home monitoring strategies to detect early conversion to neovascular exudative disease, since we know they're there at a little bit of a higher risk. I'm going to skip back for just a second. And then we're moving on to advanced stage macular degeneration, which comes in two flavors, right? We have central geographic atrophy or neovascular exudative disease. But we can further subclassify neovascular AMD into exudative and non exudative forms. So, exudative choroidal neovascularization has exudative features, right? There's fluid, there's hemorrhage, there's leakage on fluorescein angiography versus non-exudative macular or neovascularization composed of vessels that have um, non-permeable vessel walls. And so they're not associated with OCT fluid. There's no hemorrhage, there's no leakage. 
This term also implies that there's been no prior anti-VEGF therapy, that the eye is treatment naive. We can further uh, subclassify exudative neovascularization as either active or inactive forms. Active exudative AMD typically requires uh, treatment, so referral for anti-VEGF therapy, especially upon initial detection in an eye with good vision, right? So those active exudative neovascular AMD cases, make sure you pick up and you're referring appropriately for prompt anti-VEGF therapy. It's also really important to note here from the ARED study, they told us that among patients that already have neovascular AMD in one eye, the risk for neo in the fellow eye is absolutely huge, right? 42% at five years. So you watch that fellow eye like a hawk because you know there's a high risk of neovascular disease. Let's now shift gears and talk about the real highlight superstar of this evening, which is geographic atrophy. So we know geographic atrophy is characterized by irreversible tissue loss. And we're talking about three layers that are lost in or becoming atrophic. That is the RPE, the photoreceptors, and the choriocapillaris. And typically when we're using the term geographic atrophy, it implies that the eye is treatment naive, meaning the, there's been no prior like anti-VEGF therapy, there's no neovascularization present. And studies show that geographic atrophy affects about 8 million individuals worldwide, and in the United States is about 1 to 1 and a half million. And if we look at like all cases of macular degeneration, approximately 20% or 1 in 5 will have some geographic atrophy present. There are certain geographic atrophy patterns that we know predispose to faster enlargement, faster progression, and therefore have an increased risk for future vision loss, and are probably more likely to benefit from complement inhibition therapy. So individuals that have extrafovial geographic atrophy lesions or non-center involved geographic atrophy progress faster than eyes that have central involving lesions. We also know individuals that have multiple patches of geographic atrophy, what we call multifocal, are more likely to progress compared to individuals that just have one patch of geographic atrophy. And then this one makes sense, right? The larger the lesion, the faster it's going to progress, right? Because there's more surface like edge area for it to enlarge over time. So larger lesions are gonna progress faster. And then individuals that have geographic atrophy in the fellow eye are also going to progress faster. There's a substantial risk for non-central geographic atrophy or extrafoveal GA to encroach upon and invade the fovea. And usually at that point, that results in a substantial decrease in vision. And so in the original ARED study, the median time from any geographic atrophy diagnosis to then foveal involvement, where it hits the center of the fovea, was only two and a half years, which is a pretty short time frame. And furthermore, data from the AREDS-2 study showed that over half of eyes, 57%, that entered the study with extrafoveal GA suffered central involvement by the four-year time point. But it's important to note that AREDS supplements in the original AREDS study, when they looked at the subpopulation of just geographic atrophy, you know, AREDS didn't have much impact in terms of the development or expansion of geographic atrophy, but you still do want to, you know, educate patients on using, uh, you know, I've converted to AREDS 2 at this point in time, but using AREDS 2 supplementation because individuals with geographic atrophy can convert and also get neovascular exudative disease too. And we know that AREDS supplements are effective at decreasing the risk of conversion to exudative disease. So still recommend it even in eyes that have geographic atrophy, but be aware that from the atrophy standpoint, it's not beneficial so much. You know, visual impairment from AMD really has substantial functional and mental health impacts on our patients. You know, areas of geographic atrophy where there are no photoreceptors correspond to dense absolute scotomas, such that even patients with non-central geographic atrophy may experience difficulties with reading, facial recognition, and driving that can ultimately impact their independence. 
And older adults with visual impairment are more likely to suffer from anxiety, depression, and exhibit increased rates of mortality and suicide. You know, perhaps some of that is due to a risk of falls and also due to social isolation. Multimodal retinal imaging, especially fundocidal fluorescence and OCT play a critical role in early geographic atrophy diagnosis. And we need to be familiar with how to detect early geographic atrophy using these imaging techniques. I wanna highlight the classification of atrophy meetings group, or for short, the CAM group, which was an international group of experts. This was retina specialists that got together to try to define OCT features of geographic atrophy and geographic atrophy precursors or like high risk features for future GA development. And while they recognize that OCT is the primary imaging modality for visualizing geographic atrophy, they felt that multimodal imaging, that type of approach was optimal. So we're combining color fundus photography, fundus autofluorescence, near infrared reflectance, along with various OCT techniques to detect early geographic atrophy and predict who's gonna develop or who's gonna enlarge and progress over time. So we're gonna go through each of these imaging modalities. The first being color fundus photography. So on color fundus photography, geographic atrophy appears as a lighter hypopigmented area with sharply demarcated borders. And you know, the contrast between the geographic atrophy and the surrounding retina isn't very uh, striking and it can be easy to miss small areas of geographic atrophy with color fundus photography and just ophthalmoscopy alone. So color photography, really an ineffective way to detect early geographic atrophy OCT and fundus autofluorescence are definitely going to be superior to this imaging modality. Next is fundus autofluorescence. So OCT, fundus autofluorescence, your two primary imaging modalities for GA. So this is one of them. And fundus autofluorescence measures the amount of lipofusion accumulation within the retina. And I like to think of it as like a metabolic map of the RPE because it reflects the ability of the RPE to like engulf or eat those outer segment discs that are being shed by the photoreceptors. And the a basic interpretation of fundus autofluorescence, right? Hypofluorescent dark areas represent missing RPE. So areas of geographic atrophy. Whereas hyperfluorescent areas represent sick, dying RPE. And uh, when we look at specifically geographic atrophy, these lighter areas on fundus autofluorescence are gonna be areas where geographic atrophy is likely to expand over time. So even if you're seeing in a patient, you know, a new patient for an initial exam, you can still predict, even though you don't have any past data about progression, you can predict the future with fundus autofluorescence and say this is likely a lesion that's gonna enlarge versus someone that maybe doesn't have this hyper autofluorescence not in large. Fundus autofluorescence, one of the primary methods to detect and monitor geographic atrophy lesions. So on a fundus autofluorescence imaging, geographic atrophy is going to be a dark hypofluorescent area with well demarcated borders. And as you can see in this case here, superior to color fundus photography in detecting some of these early subtle geographic atrophy lesions. And research has shown that there's prognostic value in the phenotype FAF presentation or pattern of geographic atrophy. And so this study, the GAIN study, found that geographic atrophy that had a continuous band of surrounding hyper autofluorescence or eyes where there was diffuse hyper brightness throughout the entire posterior pull were faster progressors compared to individuals that had no surrounding hyperautofluorescence or individuals that only had little focal patches along the margin of GA. The phenotype pattern that had the fastest rate of enlargement was called diffuse trickling, where you have sort of diffuse hyperfluorescence throughout the entire um, posterior pull, 
But then there's an area of right around the area of geographic atrophy that is hyper autofluorescent, and it sort of trickles out into the periphery. Let's now move on and talk about near infrared reflectance imaging. And, you know, Missy Elliott is on here because you have to put your thing down, flip it, and reverse it, right? So we just said fundus autofluorescence GA is dark, whereas in near infrared reflectance imaging, GA is bright. And when we talk about INFOS OCT, GA is also going to be bright on that imaging modality as well. So you got to know what technology you're using and whether the GA is going to be dark like FAF or bright with near infrared reflectance or INFOS OCT. And near infrared reflectance, you probably have access to it and maybe don't even know it. You're like, oh, is this a special camera? If you have an OCT, it typically that grayscale image that shows you where it took the raster scans is a near infrared reflectance image. A great way to monitor geographic atrophy progression over time, as you can visualize here. OCT and geography plays a role in geographic atrophy, more so because we know that there is an increased risk of conversion to neovascular macular degeneration in patients undergoing these complement inhibition therapies. So OCT and geography can be valuable in screening for neovascular development, a potential side effect of therapy. Uh, but in general, if you're just doing OCT and geography on an individual with geographic atrophy, you could be fooled into thinking that this transmission artifact is a choroidal neovascular membrane when indeed it is not, right? And so look at the corresponding cross-sectional scan. If you have thinning, loss of tissue, that's indicative of atrophy. You also see this choroidal hypertransmission, which is truly what we're seeing here on the OCTA in FOSS image. Whereas if this was truly neovascularization, that's characterized by thickening on cross-sectional OCT, right? So we're able to say, oh no, that's just atrophy and not a neovascular membrane. Also keep in mind as we're watching these eyes with geographic atrophy, um, screening them for neovascular development, that neovascularization tends to form on the border of geographic atrophy lesions if it's going to develop. Let's now go through OCT, and I want to talk about the main layers that would be affected with geographic atrophy. So the easiest one to identify is probably the outer nuclear layer, which is at the base of the fovea. It's dark. It contains the cell bodies of the photoreceptors. Right above that, we have the outer plexiform layer, a hyperreflective bright band. And then we have a series of four hyperreflective bands that represent the photoreceptor RPE Brooks membrane complex. And we'll go from anterior to posterior here. So the most anterior thin hyperreflective line here is the external limiting membrane. The one right below that is arguably the most important layer. This is the photoreceptor ellipsoid zone, or some people call it the photoreceptor integrity line, because it correlates best with visual acuity and visual function in most retinal diseases. Underneath that, we have what we, I call the cost line or cone outer segment tips. So it is like the tips of photoreceptors as they interdigitate with the RPE surface. And then just under that, which is like the thickest, brightest band, is the RPE. Technically, under that, we would have Brooks membrane, but we typically can't visualize Brooks membrane in a healthy eye. We only see it in pathology. If there's a pigment epithelial detachment, or in this case, just sick RPE that's kind of separating up off of Brooks membrane. So let's go over OCT features of geographic atrophy lesions. Photoreceptor loss, RPE loss, right? And technically by definition from that CAM study group, you're seeing that area of photoreceptor and RPE loss has to be at least 250 microns in diameter to be considered like full-blown geographic atrophy. Anytime we have loss of the RPE, Remember, OCT is using light waves, right? So our light wave source is able to penetrate down through that window defect in the RPE and really light up the choroid like we've never seen it before. So choroidal hypertransmission results in these bright vertical columns 
with increased visualization of the choroidal details that we typically don't get. Another uh, technique in terms of OCT analysis that's kind of unique and I think great for visualizing geographic atrophy is INFOS OCT. So, you know, we're used to these cross-sectional OCT scans, but on INFOS OCT, we're slicing through the retina in the opposite direction. So we're actually taking a slice parallel to the retinal surface just underneath the RPE. So your preset may be entitled like a sub-RPE slab. What we're basically visualizing with that is a 2D map of choroidal hypertransmission. So we're just looking at this bright area that's coming down into the choroid. Imagine if we're taking an OCT slice this way through it, we're gonna be able to visualize bright areas that correspond to RPE loss or areas of geographic atrophy. And sometimes you can get quantitative analysis with this as well. Right, so you can get information about how the geographic atrophy area is enlarging over time. You can also get information about how close it is to the center of the fovea and how it's encroaching upon the fovea over time as well. This particular example here was a patient of mine. This is the course of about five and a half years. You can see she goes from having a few like patches kind of in the paramacular region to almost engulfing the entire macula within five and a half years time. So we know the development, you know, the process of how individuals get geographic atrophy can be a really complex process that's not the same for all eyes and all individuals. And as we go from these earlier stages to like complete RPE and photoreceptor atrophy, there's numerous ways that can occur, right? One way is we can have collapse of large soft drusen. In other individuals, there may be loss of the RPE followed by then loss of the photoreceptors. Or rarely, in some cases, we have loss of photoreceptors that's then followed by loss of the RPE. So, you know, everyone's a little bit different in how they develop geographic atrophy. The uh, CAM, that Classification of Atrophy Meetings Group, remember this is that panel of retinal specialist experts that got together and trying to say, what is the OCT features that define full-blown geographic atrophy? And what they called that was CRORA. So complete RPE and outer retinal atrophy, CRORA for short. And I think you're gonna start hearing more and more of this terminology with these new geographic atrophy medications on the market. And they defined CRORA basically as loss of the RPE and photoreceptors with corresponding uniform choroidal hypertransmission that's at least 250 microns in diameter. And let's compare that with what they now called IRORA, incomplete RPE and outer retinal atrophy. So this is like impending or nascent geographic atrophy, something that in the future could turn into geographic atrophy. Right, so that may be some thinning or disruption, attenuation of the photoreceptors in RPE, some non-uniform columns of choroidal hypertransmission, so I think this is a great example of an eye that has an obvious area of complete RPE and outer retinal atrophy, uniform choroidal hypertransmission. And if that's at least 250 microns in diameter, that's CRORA versus this lesion, which is more indicative of IRORA. High resolution OCT affords us the opportunity to identify the earliest stages of the atrophic process before geographic atrophy is gonna manifest clinically to us. So let's review some of the more uh, important risk factors for OC, or excuse me, the OCT risk factors for development of geographic atrophy. So basically what are these high risk biomarkers on OCT that increase the risk of geographic atrophy in the future? And if you see them, then you should monitor a patient more closely knowing they're at greater risk of developing GA. So the first is subsidence or sinking of the inner nuclear or uh, outer plexiform layer, right? So the outer plexiform layer kind of sinks down and forms this V-shaped configuration. And the reason this happens is as the photoreceptors and the RPE uh, atrophy away, right, that tissue just like sinks down into that sinkhole and forms a V-shaped configuration. Some individuals call it a gall wing configuration. I guess if you live near the beach, it must be nice, right? 
Um, another feature is external limiting membrane descent. So you have this downward curve of the external limiting membrane, and that usually is on either side of that impending geographic atrophy lesion. Other features are hypo-reflective wedges. So these are dark triangles. They usually come in a pair, again, with one on either side of the impending geographic atrophy lesion. Um, and the base of the triangle is against the RPE with the apex facing up. Loss of the ellipsoid zone of the photoreceptors and external limiting membrane integrity may also be present. And that's evidenced as discontinuous or decreased intensity of the signal of the ellipsoid zone uh, hyperreflective bands. And that can even occur over top of drusen, right? Over time, this large soft drusen is going to collapse and form geographic atrophy. We can already start to see some choroidal transmission coming down through that area of compromised RPE and photoreceptor loss. Soft drusen collapse and regression is another way that we can develop geographic atrophy. It's really going to emphasize that regression of drusen, right? You're like, oh, the drusen's going away. How great. You know, that AREDS must really be working. You know, regression of drusen is a bad prognostic feature in macular degeneration that really clues you in that advanced macular degeneration is coming. Some advanced form, whether it's neovascularization or in this particular case, geographic atrophy. Some other high-risk biomarkers for progression to advanced stage macular degeneration that we can see and, and really highlight on OCT are these uh, hyperreflective foci. So these bright dots within the retina, which correspond to anterior migration of the RPE. So you have RPE that's activated and it migrates anteriorly within the retina it corresponds on color fundus photography as these hyperpigmented spots. Here's some more examples, right, of these hyperreflective intraretinal foci, again, corresponding to hyperpigmented uh, portions on the color fundus photography. And they often sit up on top of large soft drusen. Another high risk feature for future development of geographic atrophy or sub-RPE hyperreflective columns. And so this is just kind of intermittent uh, choroidal hypertransmission, these narrow vertical hyperreflective bands. It's telling you the RPE integrity is compromised, that it's allowing some light to transmit through. Particular pseudodrusin or subretinal drusenoid deposits is a high risk subtype of drusen that we can visualize so nicely using OCT technology. Whereas on color fundus photography and you know, just clinical exam, it may be quite subtle and difficult to detect. Right? So subretinal drusenoid deposits or reticular pseudodrusen on OCT appear as these hyperreflective nodular deposits above the RPE. That's why we're calling them subretinal deposits. And this is different than, say, soft drusen, where the uh, drusen material is deposited under the RPE, so between the RPE and Brooks membrane. This is a deposit between the photoreceptors and the RPE. And this particular drusen subtype is high risk for progression to advanced macular degeneration, especially geographic atrophy. Another feature here I want to point out is this like thin choroid. So a thinner choroid also predisposes to geographic atrophy development. We can visualize reticular pseudodrusen um, nicely on OCT, but also on near-infrared reflectance imaging, as well as fundus autofluorescence. Reflectile uh, kind of glistening drusen on clinical exam are a risk factor for geographic atrophy development and that's going to correlate with either one of two OCT findings. The first being a drusen with a hypo-reflective dark core internally. You see that correlates with that reflectile drusen on our clinical examination. Or you could have on OCT, rather than a, a drusen with a hypo-reflective core, you could have this sub-RPE hyper-reflective plaque. 
Um, on OCT, so this appears as a hyperreflective linear lesion, usually located in the subretinal or sub RPE space. So let's look at some of these high risk biomarkers and go through a case. This is a 70 year old male. He's coming, he's got some risk factors for macular degeneration, right? High blood pressure, cholesterol, heart disease. Uh, fortunately, he has never been a smoker. He's not really good about taking his A red supplementation. He's had a history of dry macular degeneration in the past, and his vision is quite good, 2020 in both eyes. Looking at just the color fundus photography, there's a striking amount of drusen, definitely at least one large size drusen, which would push us into intermediate stage AMD. I also want to point out that he has some uh, small hyperpigmentary changes there in the superior uh, nasal aspect of the fovea, again, consistent with at least intermediate stage. AMD. So once we hit intermediate stage, we say, oh, we need to do some imaging, right? OCT, fundus autofluorescence, are really going to be critical in helping you detect early geographic atrophy and OCT in detecting neovascular disease. So let's look at his OCTs here at baseline in the left eye. So he has some intraretinal hyperreflective foci. And remember that corresponds to hyperpigmentary changes on color fundus photography. He also has this area, sort of just uh, temporal to the macula there, of ellipsoid zone loss. And just underneath that area of ellipsoid zone loss, there is a hyperreflective sub-RPE plaque. And remember, that correlates with reflectile glistening drusen that we can visualize on color fundus photography and ophthalmoscopy. Going right through the center of the fovea, he has a striking amount of reticular pseudodrusen or subretinal drusenoid deposits, a drusen subtype, particularly high risk for future geographic atrophy. And then in the inferior portion of the fovea, we have this impending geographic atrophy lesion where we have loss of the photoreceptors and RPE with some choroidal hypertransmission. We have that sinking of the outer plexiform layer that's forming that V-shaped configuration. And then we have a pair of hyporeflective triangles or wedges on either side of that lesion. So let's see what happens to this individual over time. We know he has a lot of risk factors for developing geographic atrophy. So if we look at the baseline here is the left-hand column, one and a half year follow-up here in the middle, and then his three-year follow-up over on the right-hand side. And we're looking at like the superior macula, the middle of the fovea, and then the inferior foveal regions. So if we follow across this blue area, or blue arrow, excuse me. Remember, he had this area of uh, intraretinal hyperreflective foci and hyperpigmentation on color fundus photography that was overlying this large soft drusen here. Over time, that drusen collapses. Remember, drusen regression, drusen collapse is a bad thing. And that forms an area of impending geographic atrophy at the three-year mark. If we follow across the green arrow now, remember that was an area of the lipsoid zone loss with a uh, hyperreflective sub-RPE plaque that corresponded to our listening reflectile drusen on color fundus photography. Over time, that becomes a very obvious area of impending geographic atrophy as well. And then if we look down at the inferior foveal region and the uh, where we had that impending geographic atrophy lesion on baseline examination, over time we can see that increase in size. So the especially the choroidal hypertransmission you can see is increasing in horizontal diameter, so getting larger over time. And then adjacent to that, he develops another area of impending geographic atrophy. You no know, multimodal imaging is best. Right, so we're not just using OCT to monitor because here we're just looking at like cross-sectional scans, right? I got to get a better sense of what is the area of geographic atrophy and how that's changing and progressing over time. So near infrared reflectance imaging is going to be a great way to do that. We typically get that along with our just conventional OCT scan. So on his near infrared reflectance imaging, we can see on baseline all these reticular pseudodrusen. And at the one and a half year mark, we have some obvious areas of geographic atrophy, which are hyper or bright on near infrared reflectance, and how they increase in size and number over the course of that three year time mark.
Fundus autofluorescence, another great way to monitor progression of geographic atrophy over time. Also a great way to try to predict the future and say who is going to enlarge the fastest that may benefit from complement inhibition therapies. So these dark areas are areas of geographic atrophy. And we were looking at the left eye earlier as we were following him through the three-year course. These areas of hyper autofluorescence, which is kind of this paramacular ring, are high risk for progression in the future, where he may develop this like ring around the fovea of geographic atrophy. So let's now talk about the two newly FDA-approved complement inhibition therapies for geographic atrophy, both of which were approved last year. Avacyn Captad Pegol, or ACP for short, marketed under um, iSurvey, is one of them. And then Pegseta Copeland, or uh, Savovri, is the other one. They are both complement inhibitors, but they target different portions of the complement pathway. So a ACP is a C5 inhibitor, whereas Pegsetacoplin is a C3 inhibitor. They are both FDA approved in the uh, treatment of geographic atrophy secondary to macular degeneration. So it can't be like RPE loss from uh, degenerative myopia or histoplasmosis or whatever. It has to be macular degeneration related geographic atrophy. And it does not have to be center or non-center involved, right? The FDA approval did not specify that. The phase three clinical trials for ACP were GATHER1 and GATHER2. For Pegsetacoplin, it was Oaks and Derby. And important to recognize there were differences in the enrollment criteria between these two different uh, drugs or medications. ACP and GATHER1 and GATHER2 only included non-center involved lesions that were threatening the center. So it had to be within one disc diameter from the center of the fovea, but not involving the center. So threatening, but not involving. They also excluded patients that had neovascularization in the fellow eye. You know, in both studies, uh, the treated eye could not have neovascular exudative disease. And I think that's important. You're really targeting patients to refer that have geographic atrophy only and do not have neovascular exudative features for complement inhibition, let's say. And then in the uh, Oaks and Derby phase three clinical trials that evaluated the efficacy of pegsetacoplin in the therapy for geographic atrophy, they included both lesions that involved the center of the fovea and didn't. And the majority of patients in the study actually had center-involved geographic atrophy. And what they looked at as their primary endpoint is the change in total geographic atrophy lesion area over time, and they assessed that with fundus autofluorescence imaging. So in GATHER2, and this is evaluating uh, iSurvey or ACP, patients for the first year of the study were treated monthly with ACP. And then in the second year of the study, they were randomized to either every other month or monthly injections. And what they found is at the end of two years, with every other month treatment during that second year time frame, the decreased geographic atrophy growth by approximately 20% compared to sham. So we're looking at this like bluish purple line compared to sham, uh, which is the GA growth over time, represented by this kind of orangish yellow line here. For save ovary in the Oaks and Derby combined data trials, they also found about a 20% overall reduction in geographic atrophy lesion growth with monthly dosing compared to sham at the two year mark. Notably, the longer you treat, the greater the effect. Right? So part of your patient education, which is really important, is to say this is a chronic therapy. This isn't just a one and done injection. The longer we extend treatment and do injections, the greater, you can see the greater the separation between sham and treatment, the greater the benefit. When we separate out the data from Oaks and Derby, whether a patient had center-involved geographic atrophy or non-center-involved geographic atrophy, it really highlights that non-center-involved geographic atrophy benefits more from therapy than individuals who are already center-involved. It also kind of makes sense that if you have non-center-involving GA, you have more to lose, right? Because usually the vision could be good, like 2020, even though you have this large paracentral scotoma, right? So what they found, so if you look at like monthly injections at two-year mark, and this is the combined Oaks and Derby data, for non-subfobial lesions, 
there was a 26% reduction in growth compared to sham versus center involved lesions, it was 19%. So better benefit in extra foveal non-center involved lesions. That's who you really want to target to refer who we know is going to uh, benefit from therapy. The Gale was an extension study of the Oaks and Derby. So Oaks and Derby went two years, and then we now have six months past that, which takes us to 30 months um, in the Gale extension study. And in eyes with extra foveal, is this non-center involved geographic atrophy lesions, upon initial enrollment into the study, they're finding 45% reduction compared to the projection sham with monthly dosing. So we talked about structure and, you know, it's good that, you know, it slows the rate of growth. It doesn't halt it, right? It just slows it down by about 20%, give or take, right? But how about visual function? But if it only affects structure, but doesn't improve visual function, then it's unlikely to be used as a clinical therapy, right? So let's look at some of the functional data that came out of these clinical trials. This was some post hoc exploratory analysis of GATHER1 and GATHER2. And what they found is that treatment reduced the risk of persistent vision loss. That is a loss of three lines of visual acuity that was measured on two consecutive visits by 56% with treatment compared to sham. And that was at a one year mark in um, the GATHER1 and GATHER2 trials. When we look at the visual acuity and visual function, function data from the combined Oaks and Derby trials, and we include all the patients, so those that had extra foveal GA and those that had foveal center involving GA, there was no difference statistically at the end of the two year mark with regards to best corrected visual acuity or the other visual function scores that they were assessing. But remember, extra foveal patients do better. So when we isolate out just the extrafoveal geographic atrophy or non-center involved geographic atrophy eyes, they found that those eyes ended about one line better in visual acuity compared to sham. They also had some better vision-related quality of life scores. Let's now talk about adverse events, right? You can't have your cake and eat it too. There's got to be some bad things that come with it. And one of those adverse events that's important to be familiar with is a dose-dependent increased risk of macular neovascularization. So if we look at Oaks and Derby evaluating a safe ovary, right, with monthly injections at two years, 12% developed neovascularization. Every other month injections was 7%, and then with sham, it was 3%. A similar increase in the risk of macular neovascularization was also found in GATHER1 and GATHER2 evaluating eye survey. So it's both medications carry this particular risk. For us, what it means is that it's important for us to still watch for neovascularization. So if you have a patient that's undergoing complement inhibition therapy, still watch them for neovascularization and make sure they're doing home monitoring. So ancillary grid or like nodal vision for see home screening at home. Another important um, side effect that has come out more recently is severe intraocular inflammation events that occurred uh, post FDA approval with safe ovary. So during the Oaks and Derby trial, they did have a low rate of intraocular inflammation of 0.24% per injection, but no cases of occlusive vasculitis were reported during the clinical trials. But once it was FDA approved and released and obviously being used more frequently, a lot more injections were being done, we were able to detect some of these really rare events of severe intraocular inflammation that caused occlusive retinal vasculitis and uh, in some patients, irreversible severe vision loss. They estimated this occurrence as being about one per 10,000 injections, so very, very low. If we think about the incidence of endophthalmitis, that's about one in 2,000. So this is incredibly rare, but a potential side effect. If we look at GATHER1 and GATHER2 evaluating eye survey, there was one case of non-visually affecting intraocular inflammation uh, that resolved without sequelae. Another important side effect to be aware of is ischemic optic neuropathy. So there was about a 2% ischemic optic neuropathy rate in individuals being treated monthly with save ovary, there was one case of ischemic optic neuropathy in GATHER1 evaluating ACP as well. So let's go over some referral 
like general guidelines. And you know, put a disclaimer that this is my own personal thoughts and opinions as to how you should manage geographic atrophy. Patients that are going to benefit most from therapy are extrafoveal non-center involved lesions. They still have good vision left to save, especially if they've documented progression to you. You know that they're growing rapidly over time. You really want to target those individuals to treat. The individuals have to be, and I educate my patient that it is an intravitreal injection, that it's chronic therapy, right? So they have to be willing to undergo injections at least every other month probably for a period of at least a year to see some benefit from the therapy. And they have to be in good enough health and have enough life left to live to really be able to go through that like year of treatment. If you have documentation of progression, because we've been just having these patients sit in our chairs, watching them lose vision, sadly enough, right? So we probably do, right? If you have this sort of documentation, send that along with the referral. So the retina specialist is aware of how quickly this geographic atrophy has been changing over time. Patients that probably won't benefit, those that have extensive center involving geographic atrophy and poor vision, unfortunately, they've lost it all. There's nothing left to save, right? Individuals who have had past neovascular disease with discoform scarring and fibrotic tissue in the center of the fovea, again, usually the vision isn't good and there's nothing really left to save there either. Your patient education is critical. Right, make sure the patients understand geographic atrophy is progressive and irreversible. The vision loss we can't bring back. Set realistic expectations. It's going to slow the progression, but not halt it. The vision will continue to get worse, even while the patient's undergoing therapies. Make sure they know that this is an intravitreal injection and that this is chronic therapy. And emphasize the importance of home uh, self-screening for neovascular conversion, since we know there's an increased rate of that with therapy. I'm gonna leave you with this, which I think is the ideal candidate for a referral. An individual has center-involved geographic atrophy, poor vision 2100. This is not gonna be the target eye for treatment, but what is is the fellow eye that has extrafoveal geographic atrophy, good vision of 2040. This is someone who knows what it's like to go blind in an eye from geographic atrophy. They're gonna be highly motivated to preserve whatever vision they possibly can in the extrafoveal geographic uh, atrophy eye.